the Radical Secular Podcast, a demand for justice, equality, and rational public policy. Hello, and welcome back to the Radical Secular. I'm Joe Cupinti. I'm Christoph Defoe. I'm Sean Prophet. And so here's part two of our ongoing show on key consequential science-related developments of our times as it relates to social justice. So let's let's go ahead and segue back into the population issue a little bit more. And what I want to talk about here is another part of the rhetoric, another part of the discourse that we have to sort of reclaim. Humanity is extremely diverse, and this certainly plays into the overpopulation issue a lot. As you said, Sean, sadly, there are a lot of people on the right and even some on the left that would be perfectly happy to have a slaughter and a die off and a, you know of the human population that's just a fact we i've heard the rhetoric many times myself mm-hmm. but we should discuss the population dynamics and tackle the pro- other problems that we also need to focus on like race for example mm-hmm. and let me just first of all clarify a few terms here the difference in ethnicity and race because i don't think everybody understands it's used interchangeably sometimes but they're very distinct terms and ha- and, re- and and the fact that they're distinct has power implications so what we're talking about language again here and these terms matter because they shape the way people think they shape minds which ter- in turn shapes their ideologies and shapes politics and so on so the difference in the terms comes from history. Race as a term was first used in the late 16th century during the colonial period. There were five distinct races that emerged from that discourse, uh, largely uh, you know, top level scientists and, and, and you know, the, the 0.1% of the, of the top, you know, that's what the discourse was coming from. And I'm sorry, Christoph, I have to digress here a little bit. Yes, mm-hmm. democracy, but democracy like maybe the founding fathers had democracy, right? There, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the very tiny, tiny percentage of the of corp- uh, the corporation itself, with all the people in it, has a democracy. But exactly, anyway. exactly. <laughs> yeah. But but your point still stands, though. I, I think your point <laughs> still stands. But I just had to say that. Anyway. No, no, no. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so these five races was literally a justification for white conquest. That's what they were. Mm-hmm. And despite the fact that these racial categories have such an ugly history, and they're very arbitrary, they basically have stuck to this day. We still see the world this way. It's incredible if you think about it. Now, the term ethnic was coined more, much more recently in the mid 20th century, and it was post-World War II, it was to define the difference among Europeans based on national groups, national origin. And uh, it was a way for academics at first and other people, media and so forth, talk about difference in a post-Nazi, post-white nationalist world, essentially. And eventually, the term ethnic was trying to be used more generally to apply to everyone around the world as just describing difference, but it really never took. Um, and so it kind of meddled and muddled its way back into a sort of this, this vague and bizarre kind of concept. And race, on the other hand, has come roaring back as a concept because of what's happened with the right and the resurgence of, of white nationalism and all of that. And the, the, the efforts to try to, you know, to change the, the discourse and the language failed for many reasons, I don't, we don't have time to talk about them. We have talked about them in the show before, but race has powerfully reemerged, and that's the narrative. It's very consequential now to the way we see the world. Again, it's shaping our minds, and shaping our thoughts, and our, our, our discourse, our ideology, and our, ultimately our politics. And I don't want to give any credence here to the belief that race is not an objective uh, fact, because it, it is clearly is not an objective fact. Um, it's actually maddening to me that we still have to talk about this in the second decade of the 21st century, but we do. The term race uh, is bringing in, in our, in sort of in a, in a sort of a latent way, our understanding of race as essentialist again, and we have to challenge that. As progressives or 
uh, post-liberal, maybe it's a better term now, <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to take back the narrative. Uh, race may not be real in terms of biology, but it sure is real in people's lives and people's minds. And Sean and Christoph, both of you have dedicated much of your lives to anti-racism. I really would love to hear your views on how to ethically address this conundrum I'm, I'm posing here. Race is real in experience, but not real in nature. How do we talk about race then? How do you guys feel about the fact that some of on the left speak of race in these essentialist terms, for example? And for the audience, by the way, I promised you numbers, and I get, I'll give you the numbers about population in a bit, but I've learned over time that numbers without context just might as well forget them, right? You need the context first, and then the numbers come later. I think I used to do it the other way around and, you know, glazed looks. So anyway, what do you guys think? Well, okay, so we've, you know, we've talked about the topic of race at length on many episodes. And I want to ask you for a quick clarification here. When you are saying that the left is talking about race in essentialist terms, what are you referring to? Yeah, I think I was, I poorly stated my thought there. I don't, I'm not hearing anybody specifically saying that race is a natural thing on the left. Not at all. I'm not hearing that. But what, what I was trying to get at is the notion that we have to constantly challenge the essentialist viewpoint. And I don't think it's being, that's happening as much as it should on the left. And I think that there, in some cases, when we, as, as a social justice activist, we need to continue that tradition of trying to uh, really shape the narrative in, in those terms. Yeah. So I'm glad you caught me on that one. I think you're right. I think I said it poorly. Well, no, I, I just, I, 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 we, we, I, cause I think it's essentialism is something that we really have to challenge. And I was just trying to yeah. think of some examples on the left that we could, that we could challenge. There probably are a few people in the left that will say stuff like that, but I don't think there's any major characters, any major figures that do that I know of. I don't know if you, if you, either of you do. Well, well, I mean, what do you guys think about it from this perspective, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of times on the left, we talk about race and identity, w whether it be race or anything else, as if it's so inherent to the person, right? So, um, and I, and and that hmm. is, it is not literally essential, it's like sort of, um, this is what, let me put it another way, this is what Sam Harris always rails about, right? So like, and he's wrong, obviously, but, his, mm -hmm. but, but the nub of his point is, well, look, we really aren't all we really are all the same. So why do we keep focusing on this issue on race? And of course, the reason is because, like you said, Joe, we've been through centuries and millennia of this being race being like an essential sort of function in our society. And it's and, and it's oppressive. Race equals power in this world. Those are just the facts. Yeah. And it, and it, it's and for those who don't have power because of their race or their gender identity, in particular, we're talking about race right now. I'll stick with race. Is that um, it is it is also a badge of of it becomes a badge of identity even more intensely, right? If you are persecuted for it. So, for me, and I'll I know I kind of commandeered the conversation here, but I'll just finish my point and then I'll get no, the hell okay. off the stage. But um, but is that if race is identity, and I think it race is identity. I think the way you decouple that is really make it so that really every race really is equal. So it really doesn't matter what what whether you are white or whether you're black, and then then I think that at that point, ideas of that, these sort of structural and uh, sort of ideas of race start to disappear at that point. I, I really, that is my, that is my theory. We are nowhere near that yet, but I think that is, uh, I think that's how I think about that. Well, and that, that's yeah. exactly why the uh, the Tuck, whole Tucker Carlson thing and the I don't see color thing just has to go. Yes. Because th this is, we, we've talked so much about race and I don't have a whole lot to add here except to say that, you know, as you mentioned, Joe, uh, in modern terms, race is, a, is largely a construct of colonialism and 80% mm -hmm. of the world is non-white. And that just so happens to coincide with the 80% of the world that was colonized by the colonial powers, which right. were largely run by whites. So when we talk about race, what we're really talking about is a history of exploitation. Mm. And that was really brought home by that just incredible jaw-dropping documentary miniseries called Exterminate All the Brutes. Mm. I would really encourage everyone to watch that series. If you haven't, it's four hours. It's the most 
jam-packed education about race and colonialism that you will have ever seen in your life. So uh, on the one hand, race is definitely a construct, but it's also an easily recognizable surrogate for caste. And mm -hmm. in our modern caste system, no matter how successful you are or how much money you have, the darker your skin, the lower is your assumed caste when people look at you. And this is an incredibly unhealthy attitude. And we here on the show, of course, are certainly doing everything we can to eliminate these mental shortcuts that keep us bound to these colonialist ideas about race. But because of their hardwiring for hierarchy, people everywhere really, really fear equality. And they also fear fairness and accountability, despite what they might say about it publicly, because um, as was really was uh, was mentioned in that video that we we watched just when we started the uh, radical secular channel, which was uh, I'll put it in the show notes. It's it's <laughs> what is the name of that? It's 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 talking about hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And what he says in that video is people are all subconsciously afraid that if we hold those above us accountable, that those below us will hold us accountable. And mm -hmm. so out of that fear, we do nothing. And I think that's a lot of the reason why racism persists. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it also goes back to our discussion of power as Jane Elliott did. Um, she, you know, ask a bunch of white liberals in college if they would be willing to trade places with a black person mm -hmm. you get dead silence and <laughs> right that's because white liberals know that people of color have it worse and they're often just as unwilling unwilling to give up their white privilege in practice as conservatives are and so this is why i think it's so difficult for us to come to terms with our colonialist and genocidal history it would force too many changes yeah. Good point. Yeah. And I think it would be as I, I like this. We talked about this last week, Joe, and that like anti-racism is, is is an inside job at the end of the day. It's an inside job. Yeah. I mean, we should be in the streets. We should be saying what we're saying. We should be doing the show. But at the end of the day, it takes each individual to look within themselves and be willing to do the hard work. And that like, as I think, as you're saying, Sean, is is be like, holy shit, like, am I am I prepared to be accountable? Am I prepared to pay by the same rules as the, as the people that are below me on the cast in the cast system also play by, right? Um, because part of being up on the cast at, at, at the, in that hierarchy is not having to play by the rules that people below you have to play by. Like that's part of the game, right? That's why people love that Trump gets away, got away with stuff that he, right? That's why they fawn at people like tax uh, people, uh, rich people pay like 3% tax, right? And everyone just yeah. shrugs their shoulders because they're like, huh, they're getting away with it. It's like, they deserve that, right? They're like the sexy. So anyway, I, I just wanted to sort of piggyback on what you're saying yeah. there, Sean. It's like, it's an inside job at the end of the day. And it requires each of us to be like, holy shit, like, you know, and or or force other people to do it through systems, basically. I mean, but but bottom line is we that kind of inside job that we have to be willing to confront ourselves. Mm -hmm. Good point as well. Yeah. Now the reason why I talk about this here again, it's it's a sophisticated argument I'm trying to make, and maybe I'm not coming across right, but we're talking about when we talked about totalitarianism as being mind control, right? This is similar here. Like the language that is used shapes people's subliminal understanding of the world. It is implicit. It is a largely under conscious level. And so if we don't take the time to, you know, say that there is no such thing as race, it, what it does is it reifies the hierarchies mm. in a subliminal way. People may not even be aware of it. Even like, Sean, you mentioned Tucker Carlson, okay? He may say, I'm colorblind, and yet still believe that the white race, and he may use the term culture is superior, Western civilization is superior to other civilizations and all of that. Because you can say I'm colorblind and still believe in, in racial essentialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, right? So it's at a deeper level that I'm trying to get at, much deeper than that. Is we, we, as you said, Christoph, it's about the internal. It's about thinking about our own thought processes and our, the way uh, we are sub controlled in many ways by our society. And so what we need to do, I think, on the left is to take the narrative back. It, I can't stress that enough. Mm -hmm. We sometimes focus in on other very, very understandably 
much more explicit things, racism, explicit racism, explicit laws and policies and, and all that stuff. But the narrative ultimately is the real power behind all this in the long term, mm-hmm. right? And so I, I'm, I'm hoping that we start to do more of that. Yeah. 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 And so I want to discuss a little bit the idea of intersubjectivity here. And this might help with this, this question about what race is. Uh, let's define the terms a little bit first. An objective truth, of course, is something that is true regardless of anyone's views or perceptions or, or reflection of it. Examples would be the Earth is a spheroid or that viruses are an infectious element, <laughs> right? doesn't matter. It, it, it is what it is. It's, it's subjective. In the case of race, one can look at things like genetic drift and do a statistical analysis to determine if race is truly anything worth believing in. And of course, we know it's not. The science has been done. It's very solid. No such thing as race from a biological point of view. A subjective truth is a belief of an individual or group. And such a belief is important in, in a different way because it helps define that person or that group more than anything else, right? What they believe says, says, says a lot about them. As far as race, it could be the belief that whites are superior to people of color in intelligence or, or in culture or what, it's really the same bullshit, right? We know that. Um, and that could be the subjective truth of, of uh, an individual as well. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Am I making any sense here? I think so. I think so, Joe. Um, you know, I I don't have much to say on this other than that. Other than there is objective truth exists, right? So whatever as my my subjective ideas about it don't really matter. Um, but there is that sort of weird gray area, right? Um, and I mean, I'll use a, a, a stark example to make my point. And there is no gray area in my mind about this. Um, but this is something I remember from anthropology way back when. And that is, right, like uh, female genital mutilation, for example, right? And this is a cultural right. This is a cultural reality for people. You don't become a woman if you don't go through this process, right? There's a blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. And that is very, very real if you live in this place, in this area, under these circumstances. That's very, very real. Um, the burqa is another example of this, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, you know, these are very, very real things. Like you do not transition to the next stage of life unless you put this thing on or unless you do this thing. But nevertheless, that's a, that that is also objectively true, though, that mm-hmm. um, that that is that that is abuse, that that is that that is um, that is oppression. That is a lot of different things. So, I mean, I guess I'm a little cold hearted when it comes to this. Like, I don't really give a fuck too much about those those subjective ideas when it comes to reduct- reducing human suffering. Like, I just don't fucking care. I don't care about your culture. I don't care about your ideas. If you are murdering people or you are stoning people or you are keeping an entire group of people uh, as essentially your slaves, then I don't really care about, you know, I, and again, I'm not a diplomat. I'm not a president. I don't have to make those kind of, right? I'm just a guy on a, on a podcast. So I don't have to make yeah. those kind of hard choices and have those hard to hard conversations. But, um, that's just my thoughts off the cuff, off the cuff okay. on that. Well, I, I think we're probably all in agreement that we don't support cultural relativism here. We, you know, right. human human flourishing is a universal, and so that's right. if your culture tells you, you know, that you have to cut, you know, you're the you're, uh, the, the clit shavers, as we used to talk oh, about, God, you know, so fuck awful. you, fuck you, if that's what you're doing, All right? So, but <laughs> Joe, I was chuckling a bit when you said that uh, a spherical Earth or an infectious virus are objective truths because these are precisely the sort of obvious truths that are now being widely challenged and yeah. challenges to obvious truths have become now a widespread cultural signal for conservatives. And mm-hmm. it's almost now yeah. an inseparable part of their identity. They challenge elections, they challenge climate science, they challenge vaccinations, they challenge everything. And this brings up something really interesting that I heard recently on the Conspirituality podcast, which, you know, shout out to those guys. We love their work. Mm-hmm. Um, that is in order for gurus and demagogues to gain traction by definition, they have to challenge establishment experts. If they don't challenge establishment experts, what good are they? I mean, why do you need a guru if the guru is just going to tell you the same thing as an academic expert? You just go to university or you go to an academic conference if what you wanted was the truth. So the attraction of a guru then, any kind of cult leader, is that they are someone who will give you an excuse to not accept conventional wisdom of experts. By definition, a guru has to do this. So. Mm 
What gurus are doing then is that they are creating subcultures where the normal rules and science and expertise don't apply. Any fact or objective truth that you don't like, there's a subculture where you can go and find people who also base their identity on refusing to acknowledge that truth. Um, and uh, of course, one of those subcultures is white supremacy. And mm -hmm. yeah, white supremacist groups are places that you can go to commiserate with other people who don't believe all humans are the same. And you can even go to these groups and help get people to help you justify committing violence against those you believe are inferior. I mean, that's what those groups are for. That's what, that's yeah. why they exist. So, um, and that's precisely why those groups now represent America's number one terror threat. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you guys are speaking about what I'm trying to get at here is that there is a, there is sort of another way of looking at this and intersubjectivity is about that. Mm -hmm. it, it is that gray area, Christoph, that you mentioned. Right. And it, it's it's the complexity, it's the nuance that you're talking about, Sean, you know, in, in terms of identity. It's that idea that uh, a belief becomes axiomatic in society as though as if it were objective, mm -hmm. truthfully, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's not, but it, it is treated that way. And so morals, for example, are, are in a sense, intersubjective truths. Um, it's, it is wrong to murder, right? And that's an axiomatic belief in society, even though obviously it's, it's not perfect, <laughs> people still do it, but, <laughs> um, I, but there are subgroups as well. There's diversity, diverse cultures in society. So there, the, these truths can vary among different people. For example, Hindus believe that, it, that it's true that cows are sacred. For them, this is considered, it's their intersubjective truth, but they treat it as if it's real. Uh, for others, it's just their, their own cultural relativism or their subjectivity. In, in the Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've all heard that quote. <laughs> the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, I should say, excuse me. Uh, it's an American intersubjective truth. We treat it as if it's true, but really, if you delve into it, you know, it is a political statement. Yeah. These are more, there are more universal subjective truths like money. Money, mm. it only has value because people believe in its veracity. Stop believing in money, money is, becomes worthless. So when you think about race, race functions in that same sphere mm -hmm. of intersubjectivity. Mm -hmm. It's, it has the power as if it is objective, although it is not. Mm -hmm. and, and if we can think of it this way, I think it helps to make sense of what we see in the world. Yeah. And you think you guys think this is the, a good lens to tackle these questions with? I, I love this, uh, Joe. I think this is really an important conversation. I think it's an important conversation to be having on the left. I think it's a conversation that we on the left tend not to like to have. Like you mentioned earlier, we like to focus on it's easy to focus on what their conservatives are doing and their racist, you know, rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's a lot harder to talk about the way that we all of us including those of us on the left still are engaged in this fantasy this this uh this intersubjective reality that that there's such thing as race and if right. we're not willing to talk about that then the edifice that structure continues so i think it's really critical yeah i think that's true and uh, of course everyone has to make certain base assumptions to avoid the dreaded moral relativism, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so many people get, well, the various cultures get accused of, of you know, their, their practices being immoral. And so what's your basis for saying that, for example, right. you know, cutting off a woman's, uh, woman's clitoris is, is immoral? Well, human flourishing, right? right. Uh, that, that's not conducive to human flourishing. And so, <clears throat> you know, but there are certain types of intersubjective agreements that could be good. I mean, assuming, like Absolutely. you said, Joe, that mm -hmm. it's wrong to murder, that's a really, really good that's assumption. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. And, <laughs> and what we believe here at the Radical Secular, I think among the three of us, of course, is that our moral bedrock is that human flourishing by any, ex by extension, happiness are the most important considerations. And that all governments, the, the rational public policy that we always talk about should promote human flourishing, which by extension, requires taking into account the state of our ecosystem, the climate, mm -hmm. yes. biodiversity, et cetera. So these are our assumptions, and I don't think they're necessarily relativistic. I think they have their basis in, in, in scientific fact, and I think that's the difference. 
You know, I, we, I think we, that's right. We can say that murder, you know, uh, you know, destroys human flourishing. That's an objective statement. Um, you know, uh, unlike, uh, you know, unlike, unlike race, race is not objective, right? It's, it's an opinion. It, it, these, these are opinions about what categories we should be putting people into. Whereas we know for a fact that, you know, mutilating someone's body or killing them reduces human flourishing. So right. that's the basis of objective ethics. And go ahead, Joe. Yeah. And of course, I mean, I agree with you. And of course, human flourishing is our ethical and moral goal. And science can help us, helps describe the world so that we can learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it can guide us in that direction. Science itself isn't going to take a stand on that per se. Science just describes nature. That's what it does. It tries to understand the nature of reality. Then we do something with that. And we, we go, we, we morally make choices. And what our choice right here is that we want people to flourish. Mm -hmm. That's our choice. And so even that, you can see the intersubjectivity there. It's not an absolute truth per se. It is grounded in absolute truths because that's where we're getting the information on how to make people flourish. But then that next step is a choice that we make. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I was going to go into a big digression about, about what you said about money being a, an intersubjective agreement. I don't think it is. I would just direct everybody to our money episode where I talk about this, but um, I will not belabor that point. Yeah. Let, let's save that for another day, but I think it's a good, it's a good critique. <laughs> the good critique. I, I'd love to, I'd love to, to engage on that one at some point. Um, so let's turn to the developed and developing and underdeveloped world. These terms have replaced, of course, the old Cold War terms of first world and third world. And the second world was the Soviet bloc. First world, the West, right? Mm -hmm. The capitalist rich countries and the third world is everybody else. Um, it's interesting that we have chosen as a culture to redefine these the things in that way, more from an economic perspective than, than a geopolitical uh, military or sort of um, contest mm -hmm. that w there was before. And at least in the face of it, that seems less hierarchical to me. Um, that's the language we use in practice. Uh, there's a lot of hierarchy still in there, right? We know oh, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course it's hierarchical and it's kind yeah. of upside down to the whole capitalist thing because what is the most essential economic activity that all others depend on? Uh, food production. Yep. Famine used to be the number one enemy of humanity, and it's not anymore. And yet somehow in our modern concept of development, agrarian economies are considered to be the bottom of the barrel. A developed <laughs> nation is one that has a highly developed knowledge economy on top of a powerful industrial economy, and both depend for their function on, first on the agrarian economy. Yes. No food, no development. So I think we have all of this backward. And of course, there's a fourth level and that is even lower than the agrarian economy and is a prerequisite for it and that is the ecosystem services that nature provides that are essential for growing food the best example of this i can think of is the natural reservoirs provided by both glaciers and annual snowpack and without these services at the most basic level there can be no agriculture and by extension no developed economies and this is the one thing that climate change is disrupting around the world and we're going to have to replace those ecosystem services when they're gone. And that's going to be really, really, really expensive. Yeah, it will. It really will be um, yeah. good points. Good point, Sean. And, um, you know, what I was thinking about, Joe, uh, when we talk about the first world, second world, third world, I, you know, grew up saying those things and um, and now replaced by developing and underdeveloped. Da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like really what we're talking about is just a shift in the power, right? So, and you and you mentioned this yes. at the top, right? Like now the power comes from money directly, whereas right in neoliberal, this is neoliberalism. This is yes. neoliberalism, right? Yes. Instead of invading countries and literally taking them over with armies and tanks and bombs, what you do now is you take over them financially. So they're just basically heavily leveraged, and 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 some hedge fund in New York owns. 
a quarter of the economy. Like that's now, right? That is the sort of neo, that is neoliberalism 101. So I think it's very, very telling that now we got a guy, you know, in the, that we got away from these old Cold War terms when the Cold War ended and f- to fill the vacuum, the, uh, the, uh, the sharks on Wall Street came to fill, uh, to fill the vacuum. And here we are. You yeah. Know? It's just, I find that really interesting. It is interesting. Uh, I mean, certainly there is a powerful economic element. Yeah, it is awful too. But there was a powerful <laughs> economic element to colonialism as well. The For colonial sure. powers would shape the, their colonies to serve the mother country or the father country. So they, they would have all the higher end economy, the, the, the value added stuff. But you take, you take a copper, you turn it into copper uh, wire, it adds value to it. A pound of copper is three cents, a pound of copper wire is three dollars. Right. right. So when you have manufacturing, that's what it does. And so that's what the the colonial powers would do. And they would be taking the, the primary industry, the extraction industries, minerals and energy and food and so forth. And then they were making products with it. And then later on, it turned into services and, mm-hmm. and all the things you were talking about, Sean, with, with, with a sort of higher end knowledge economy and all that. So development really is about bringing in some of that value added processes back into the developing world so they can make their own stuff. They can produce their own knowledge economy and so forth. And I think that that is uh, a good thing that's happened. One of the reasons why we have conquered largely famine. Mm -hmm. Of course, now with climate change, that may not last, but we'll see. And so to bring it back to the population, what we're have what we have in the world here, and it goes back back to a great point you made earlier, Sean, about footprints, right? We have a world where we have uh, a privileged first world. We talked about privilege, Christoph, you mentioned that privileged first world, right? And everyone else is somewhere way behind in terms of that those that material privilege. First world people like us have a huge footprint. Uh, people in develop in the developed world, no, I'm, I'm sorry, in the developing world, and especially in the underdeveloped world, mm-hmm. have a much smaller. Part. We have a population in the earth that has these great inequities associated with it, and now we can move into looking at the climate itself and the consequences in these terms, with this reality in mind, right? Because sure. it's not just climate change is going to affect the world and hurt people. It's going to particularly hurt certain people in the world, right? Mm-hmm. In in very distinct ways. Mm-hmm. And so I want to look at this uh, these societal consequences as they particularly relate to vulnerable populations, right? It's such a vast subject, we can only address a sliver of it here. So I recommend an article in the New York Times called The Science of Climate Change Explained. Facts, Evidence, and Proof by Julia Rosen. It's a great overall review. I think we'll post it in the notes. Mm-hmm. So if you want to know a, a, a much bigger sort of view of climate change. But I want to talk about right here is just a few things. We start with water and people. And one of the things we hear most in terms of consequences is the sea level rise. Mm-hmm. Right? Everybody's mm-hmm. heard about that at this mm-hmm. point. And so a few numbers here. 10 inches since the dawn of the industrial age, roughly but it's, it's gone up in a few that's, centuries. That's wild. Um, and there are varying es- estimates about what we can expect. So the IPC estimates, it's going to get revised soon, by the way. It's coming out really, really soon. I have a feeling it's going to go up. But five years ago, they estimated one to three feet by 2100. However, since that time, there's been a great deal of science that show this could be a much, much greater number because of the instability of the, of the ice sheets of the planet. But already with 10 inches, we're seeing very severe impacts. In many places, seawater is coming up through the ground in flooding residential areas, like in Miami. It's contributing to soil subsistence, like in Singapore and in New Orleans. It's increasing the salinity of farmland and decreasing yields. This is why we need GMOs, by the way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One of the reasons. Uh, Like in, in Bangladesh, places like that. The most, the most vulnerable places, like in Bangladesh, are in the developing world, mm-hmm. where, where people of color live, right? Again, colonialism is still alive and kicking in that way. And like you said, Christoph, it's taken a new face. It's looking more like the econ- economic model 
and money has become much more powerful, much more influential and all of that. Uh, and, and that's what, how we have to frame the solutions as well. We have to look at the solutions in those terms. We have to consider privileged and less privileged people. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think? Well, sea level rise, <laughs> it's the top issue that's going to affect our world. It should be in the headlines every day, uh, but it isn't. It's going to disrupt the economy and our circumstances of living more than almost anything else. In, in many low-lying areas, like you mentioned, we're already in the grips of severe blue sky flooding, which means that the ocean is creeping into coastal roads yep. and towns, causing persistent floods when it's not raining. Um, interesting they call it blue sky flooding rather than sea level rise, right? I mean, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, there's so many euphemisms around this because it's such a huge issue that people actually, I think, deep down know and they just don't want to talk about it. Um, right. Because already in some neighborhoods, people, they can't park their cars near their houses. They have to wade through knee deep water, sometimes for blocks, just to get to their vehicles. Uh, they can't sell their homes and they can't afford to abandon them. And this is just the early stages of this. At, at some point, it won't just be knee deep water. At some point, that water rises enough to make those homes unlivable entirely. So those people are going to be homeless. They've lost their life savings. When they abandon those homes, their city tax base gets impacted and whole towns can enter a death spiral. It's yeah. devastating to think about this, but already sea level rise is impacting real estate prices. And I'm going to put an article about that in the show notes. Uh, as go real estate prices, so go property taxes and insurance. And insurance coverage in areas impacted by sea level rise and stronger hurricanes is getting harder and harder to get, if not impossible. And no insurance, no mortgage. Right. So right. Um, three more insurance companies have just pulled out of Florida in May uh, of this year. An article in the Miami Herald discusses this, but they're kind of dancing around the issue and claiming, oh, this is temporary. Um, but everybody knows that the elephant in the room is that property values are plummeting in vulnerable coastal areas in Florida. And you're starting to see that reflected now. Uh, you, even even a, a difference of like five feet can mean that your house is worth, you know, hundred thousand dollars more than one that's lower maybe even higher than that. So mm. uh, uh, risks are skyrocketing. I insurance companies aren't going to sell insurance at all in an area if they think they're going to lose money. And once homeowners stop being able to get insurance, that area is effectively redlined. So it starts the whole downward property spiral that won't end until whole towns are wiped off the map. And this doesn't even mention what sea level rise is going to do to public services and infrastructure like water yeah. and sewer systems, bridges, roads. I mean, sea level rise in America and around the world is going to be a living, breathing horror show. Yeah. yeah. And, and the only thing I'll just add to that is just to reinforce what you said earlier, Joe, and that is I'm thinking of, you know, the folks that are going to be left in these communities during those death spirals are going to be people of color. It's going to be people who are impoverished, whether they be people of color or not. Uh, it's going to be the poor. It's going to be the vulnerable. Um, it's going to be the elderly. Uh, it's going to be the the folks who it's going to be the uh, mentally disabled. It's going to be folks who can't pick up and leave. It's the same way with abortion, for example, right? Like the people who can who will, can just fly to New York and get an abortion if they want, right? But but for, if you live in Mississippi and and by maybe on the Gulf Coast, by the way, um, you know you are fucked. You're just fucked. And uh, and the conservative ethics is let them go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, let's return to the lifeboat analogy because this is why I think it gets useful. And I think you made a really, both of you made a really good critique of that analogy. And like, Sean, one of the things you said was that we can just increase the resources, we can lower our footprint, we can change the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That essentially exactly. is what you're saying. Yes. Climate change can change the lifeboat too, but the other way around. Right. So, so let's let's look at that. The sea level rises, right, and it gets rid of land. The 50 spots gets reduced to 40. Right, so the light bulb yeah. shrinks. The, the same argument you're making on the negative side, that's what climate change is doing. Mm. Right. Coastal areas are not, not only the only most populated areas on the planet, but they're also the most agriculturally productive on the planet. So then we have food shortages. Uh, most of humanity's built infrastructure, as you alluded to with insurance, is along the coast. Mm. Simply this problem alone without any other consideration is as you said, catastrophic without any historical precedent. There isn't any. Sea level rise though is not the only issue related to water. 
Uh, warming Earth is adding a great deal more energy to the ocean. For every one degree rise in 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 the Earth's temperature, uh, there's a seven percent increase in moisture content in the atmosphere. Uh, and that means more latent energy released in thunderstorms, making for bigger storms. The excess energy then changes the weather patterns, so rain goes where it's not supposed to and vice versa. And in real terms, uh, what we're seeing here is more droughts, more floods, more crop failures, and more forest fires because of, of this water issue you know, that we're dealing with. And so we can now add to the lifeboat analogy and that literally it's increasing the quickness that people are drowning in. Mm. So that if we do want to make those changes to bring those people on board because of better practices, we got to do it faster mm. and, and with more, it's going to take more energy and more power, and more wealth to do it. Right. Um, the lifeboat is just going to be losing space. And, um, Climate change impacts all people, but again, most of those swimmers are people, disadvantaged people mm -hmm. in the world, poor people, people of color, people in underdeveloped countries. Because, you know, rich cities are going to be able to mitigate a lot better than poor cities in poor yep. countries. Yep. And that's the other thing as well. It's not just individuals, it's also societies. Uh, so speaking of the reality of race, right, <laughs> it doesn't get any more real than that because this is who it's affecting, right? And, uh, you know, I just, I think we have to pause and just think about this in ethical terms and in personal terms. And I really want to hear what you guys think about it in that, in that regard. I mean, it's the ethical imperative. I, I am continuously reminded of, of Picard because I'm literally reading the book and, but I, it is, the ethical implications are astonishing. The, uh, it, and like, as you remember from the show, right, the, the, we're talking about the destruction of, of, of an entire world, uh, worlds, uh, for a sun, just for sort of right, going supernova, right? That, yeah. That's the end. That is the end of this, uh, the, the entire system, right? Um, and so the, the, that level of catastrophe is hard to wrap one's mind around. And I think that's sort of what I'm struggling to do right here. It's just like, as you're talking, Joe, it is so, interconnected it is so fundamental there is if we we either solve this problem or we die and that is that is as a person who doesn't really i don't get into the weeds about this sort of stuff personally so it's really interesting for me to hear about this this, this information like it's just it is just staggering it is staggering yeah, and one of the things that happens, I don't think that we appreciate how much our current political instability is already the result of yes. climate change great point it, and I think that, that that the other thing that happens is is that as our as our politics becomes more unstable, the economy also becomes you know it, it, you know it, there's less resources available, even just because of Republican intransigence, right? I mean, we have the ability to print enough money to fix everything if we wanted to, if Republicans would get on board for that project, right? We have that ability, but they won't. And part of the part of what has Put them in power is all the sort of fear and terror uh, of of voters at, at at America's decline, right? And and America's decline is linked to climate change, and mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a a self reinforcing feedback loop. And ethically, you know, the ethical nightmare of climate impacts and their disproportionate impact on the poor is just an extension of the ethical nightmare of capitalism generally. One more example of how capitalism privatizes the profits going to the people with houses on the hill, uh, passing them along to very wealthy investor class, and they socialize the losses, yep. fobbing them off onto the very poor who live in New Orleans or Bangladesh mm -hmm. or the Maldives. I mean, whoever. I mean, it's like that's right. I mean, everywhere that's in a, in a climate vulnerable situation, you're not seeing a lot of wealthy people living there. No. And you're also not going to see ExxonMobil or, or Royal Dutch Shell or British Petroleum rushing to save these coastal cities. They're going to wash their hands as they've done for 50 years since we first became aware of this climate threat. And one thing I think that has yet to play out that's kind of interesting is the battle between the insurance industry and the fossil fuel giants. Mm -hmm. As losses continue to pile up, it's almost certain that there will be a kind of clash of titans over who should actually pay for climate damage. Governments are on the hook for sure, and it's a big, giant, gargantuan hook. It's trillions of dollars at a minimum. And in terms of the private sector, we could actually see the insurance companies 
us and their lawyers be the ones to succeed where others have failed in taking down the fossil fuel industry. But in order for that to happen, we'd need to see some legal precedents set in terms of courts upholding the link between fossil fuel production and climate damage so they could establish there's actually a, a tort that's been done. And um, already we've seen oil companies making the argument in, in court that it's consumers who are actually to blame since they're the ones who burn the fuel. And one thing's for sure, though, it's going to get really interesting because there are conservatives and wealthy investors on both sides of the battle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do want to say something about the hopefulness. I, I avoid this, this year for a reason, right? I don't <laughs> think we're necessarily fucked. I don't, I don't behave as if we are. Mm -hmm. I act as if we're not. And so if we are going to solve this issue, at, the way we solve it has to be ethical as well. So that we need to consider everyone, all humanity, solve it for everyone, not just solve it for the, those who have access to resources and wealth. Mm -hmm. And that's the other consideration here, that no matter what happens, whether or not we are fucked or whether or not we come, we come out of this reasonably okay, the way we do it matters a great deal. So we have to, you know, you know keep our eyes on the, on the prize here. Well, and, that's, and what, that's what I mentioned. We do it. That's why I mentioned the thing about capitalism, because yeah. the, the, the issues that are brought up by climate change are the same issues, and we have to keep up our critique they of are. capitalism. Absolutely. Now, I was going to talk about the oceans, but <laughs> let's, let's save that for another day. Let, let's go <laughs> ahead and shift to um, the topic of the refugee crisis to, to end the show, because I think that's critical here, and it plays very well into what we've been talking about. So, it, in a way, it clarifies this problematic lifeboat analogy that you both very uh, eloquently critiqued earlier. Um, in 2019, let me start out with just something basic here. In 2019, there was a tropical cyclone. It wasn't even, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the most powerful storms that, that we've seen, but it was a strong cyclone that hit Mozambique, a underdeveloped country. And it, led to about 1.9 million people needing assistance from that. The storm created uh, 150,000 or so internally displaced people, damaged 100,000 homes, destroyed a million acres of crops, demolished a billion dollars worth of infrastructure. And because that country is very underdeveloped, they don't have the resources to rebuild. Mm. This is the new normal. This is what's been happening in Central America for the last few decades, where they've had some massive storm damage, catastrophic in scope. And as you said, Sean, their political consequences and instability related to climate change, this is one of them. This is what's been causing the refugee crisis for right. the United States, right? Um, this area has also experienced on top of that, severe droughts, fires, and major crop failures because of the changing climate, climate disruptions. Uh, the, the consequences are political instability, violence, hunger, fear, and all, out of that, ultimately, the result is displaced people, refugees. Mm -hmm. And so let me just take a minute to talk about the refugee numbers. I have to have some numbers in here. <laughs> <laughs> According to the UN, there's about 80 million forcibly displaced persons in the world today. By country, the, the countries most affected are Syria, 6.6 .6 million, Venezuela, 3.7, Afghanistan, 2.7 million, South Sudan, 2.3, and Myanmar, about a million. Last year, only out of that, last year, only about 120,000 refugees were resettled. And the U.S. shut its doors completely to refugee resettlement and took in almost no one. The, what a, a failure of morals there. I mean, uh, at the end of 2020, around 7 million people in the world, uh, in 104 countries and territories, were living as displaced persons because of natural disasters, primarily caused by weather related climate change. And the trend, you know, at 7 million is not a big part of the chunk yet out of the 80 million, but it's going to compound on top of that. So, and it's going to increase at the same time. So those are other 80 million, the other reasons why we have refugees are not going away, and we're going to add all this to it. So 
the working definition of an environmental refugee is basically a person displaced due to resource scarcity, which was caused by directly or indirectly by a weather event. Indirectly could be the weather event caused political instability, which in turn caused the displacement, or directly it could be like flooding that you know displaces people and so forth. So there are a lot of these key issues associated with this. One is that it's mostly happening in developing countries, mm -hmm. not in the first world, right? The old term. Um, mm -hmm. And primarily in the subtropics and the tropics, places like the Sahel in North Africa, the Central America, as we just talked about, the Asian subcontinent, like in Bangladesh, parts of India, Pakistan. Uh, and also this is what's happening is it's intensifying intra and interstate competition for resources like food, water and this is clearly being seen in the middle east mm -hmm. and north africa a lot of the wars there are about water even though they talk about oil and they talk about religion <laughs> the water <laughs> plays a huge role there in terms of political instability um you know the golan heights why did israel take that because it was it's the mouth of the uh jordan river which is mm -hmm. critical to to the region for resource now they control the they control the Golan Heights. They control the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. uh, increased U.S. border stress again from the Central America issue is another severe impact we're seeing. Also, you know the U, the hurricanes that we've seen in the U.S. The one that hit Puerto Rico a few years ago displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of some of them aren't back yet. That's what we're talking about. Even 2005 Katrina. What happened to New Orleans? It's still not back to the same population it had back then, right? That's the world we're, we're, we're going into. And as Sean said earlier, uh, insurance costs is another consequence, massive consequence, because it trickles into a lot of other yeah. uh, problems. And that's going to mean a lot of people are not going to be able to afford homes, period, because you can't get a mortgage, right. you can't afford a home. So another way of displacement, right? Another indirect effect of climate displacement. Uh, and of course, I can't, we can't, I can not mention again, the moral failure, the colossal mm -hmm. moral failure of the Trump administration. Oh my God. Uh, and essentially the lifeboat options are either, either a simple version is either you take people in, you take everybody you can and hope the, the lifeboat doesn't sink. It probably will, but you still take everybody because you're morally obligated to do that. One, two is you just you just fill the ten seats, mm -hmm. which makes you you know makes it scary because now there's no wiggle room. So if something happens, you're kind of screwed as well. But it's not as bad as the first one. And the third option is fuck them, let them drown, and that's the option that the Trump administration took, essentially. That's a that's the ethical option. Well, he was so pouring, anyway. He was pouring gasoline on the fire as well. I mean, he was not only not only did he turbocharge fossil fuel emissions. But he also wouldn't take refugees, so it's like right. he's 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 boxed these people in between two forces. And a third thing, not only didn't he take the refugees in Central America, he cut the funding to those countries that were specifically one of the reasons why we were funding those countries under the Obama administration and earlier was to try to help them to be better places to live, so people wouldn't want to leave. Exactly. Right. And and Trump cut the funding for that yeah. at the same time. It is just an astonishing, astonishingly short-sighted, ignorant, and bigoted way of looking at it. It just, it, it just makes you shake your head, man. Yeah, I mean, there's no, excuse, there's just nothing. To, I don't know what to say about it. I, no, it, it, it just boils my blood. It, it really makes does. me want to flip out. It really does. Just like people who just say "fuck them," like, like it's just, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. I know these people exist. That's why we do this. But holy shit. So now people like will criticize Biden for not being perfect on climate and not being perfect on human migration and immigration. And they'll, you know, they'll condemn, condemn him for not doing exactly what they want to do. But compare that to what we had last year. Yeah. What's, <laughs> what is Biden? How do you think he's doing anyway? Let me, let me, let me, I don't want to speak for you. How do you guys think Biden's doing with these two issues? Go ahead, Sean. Well, I think, OK, Biden is hamstrung by the Senate. I think there were a lot of things in the infrastructure bills that are in danger of potentially being stripped out uh, based on these negotiations that he's doing. Right. And I really haven't been following it that much. But I do know that Biden's original bills were slam dunk, man. They were you yeah. know, the, they had oh, yeah. almost all the aspects of the Green New Deal pretty much packaged into infrastructure bills. And that's why the Republicans hated him. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think I am generally, I think I like Biden. I think that in my mind, it feels like a, a rebranded feel of the Obama administration. And I'm a, I was a big fan of the Obama administration in general. Um, I think that he even has more political capital in a lot of ways than Obama did in his second term. So, um, but hamstrung by the Senate, right? And so I don't, I don't think this is on Biden's shoulders at all. I think that if Biden got his way, we would have the most progressive, ag- aggressive um, attack on climate change ever. But here we are. Yeah, uh, yeah like, uh, like Obama, he's going to do what he's going to do everything he can. He can exactly. He definitely. I, I'm I'm confident. That's a good way to put it, Sean. I'm confident that he will do everything he possibly can. I think that he un- he sees the connections that you've made here, Joe, over the course of this show. This intersectionality, right? Of um of uh, in a sense of all of these issues, you cannot parse them out. And anyone who understands governing sees that you can't just pull one thread out and solve it. Like it's it's all connected. And it all starts really, it starts and ends with the with with the with, with the environment. It starts and ends there. So yeah, I do agree with both of you about Biden. I think he's doing a great job as best he can. Again, it's about power here, right? What you can accomplish. We need to work on accumulating more political power on the left if we want to get this stuff done. So this is this is the beginning, right? We won this presidency, but now this, that you, we can't just sit on our laurels and say, you know, Biden should do this and do that. He needs the power. He needs the power of government to do that. Exactly. And the other thing I want to mention also is Kamala, Kamala Harris and how much flack she's been getting. She's taken on this incredible challenge of dealing with Central American refugees. Oh, my God. And it is a, just a, an amazingly powerful problem. And because of all the reasons we talked about, right? You, how, how do you solve this quickly? And it's going to take generations to really tackle this issue. So we need to have the political patience, you know, to do that. Well, and for her, it's a thankless job too. I mean, she's, it's yeah. like, it's, it's kind of like getting walked off the plank, you know, for, it's okay. <laughs> okay. You go fix immigration. Right. <laughs> and I mean, that's what Biden did some of that for Obama. And for so sure. now he's yeah. doing the same thing with his vice president. And I think, you know, if, if anybody's up to it, she's up to it. That's for damn sure. Yeah, But it's it, thankless. <laughs> it's thankless. And it is incredibly challenging. The crisis in the Central America is a, is a humanitarian crisis happening there. It's far beyond just U.S. immigration issues, right? It's a crisis for the people there. Talk about not flourishing. And it is related to climate change. It's related to gangs. It's related to violence, incredibly high murder rates, uh, corruption, so many things. And not just so- murder rates. It's it, the, the, um, in the last election, in that campaign, in the run up to the election, something like three dozen candidates, political candidates, got assassinated. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So, anyway, do either of you have any closing thoughts? We've talked about so much, but here's, <laughs> here's the end of the show. We're just about ready to wrap up. Well, I, I have a couple thoughts. I mean, okay. it's. It's really as a, a couple more thoughts. It, it, it's really easy to look at the climate crisis in terms of how is this going to impact me or can I find ways to survive this? And I think we've described in spades in this show the just the the incredible complexity, how this is an interlocking crisis yeah. and and how how the crisis itself curtails our ability to mitigate the crisis. It's like as we fall further down this hole, um, it, it, it actually, we don't have the resources that we used to have to deal with it. And that's the challenge. That is the challenge of, of our age. And those of us who are lucky enough to live in the developed world are also going to be luckier than most in terms of surviving the coming changes. And I would not be a bit surprised if we saw incredibly draconian, you know, border closures and just the the developed world, if things got really bad and there were, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of refugees on the move in the world, I could see us actually using our military to stop them from coming in. And in, 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 in a major way that hasn't been done so far, I think it has the potential to get really ugly. Um, we can adapt, and I think the temptation will be to to basically, you know, build up our lifeboat at the expense of others. And you know, we have the wealth, we have the know how to rebuild and relocate essential systems. Once we stop denying the problem, there's a lot we can do. It's not going to be pretty, but it 
could be survivable for us. The same can't be said of climate refugees or victims of climate wars. And that's, again, something we need to connect to our behavior. Every time you put gas in your tank, every time you take a plane flight, every time you consume fossil fuel electricity or make a purchase of a product that's made unsustainably, you are making the lifeboat harder to stay afloat. And, you know, these conditions that will lead to mass migration and death for the world's poorest uh, just get ever so slightly more dire every time we engage in these behaviors. So it's out of sight, out of mind for a lot of Americans and Europeans. And that's a tragedy. I, I just don't know if the humans have the evolutionary wherewithal to deal with long-term collective action problems like climate change. And, you know, the, the, but the, the cherry on top, the biggest tragedy of all is that had we listened to the scientists back in the 1980s, yeah. when James Hansen first gave his report to Congress, the United States could have led the world on this issue. We'd be at this point largely through the transition. We'd be done and um, we'd be healthier, we'd be happier, we'd be richer than we are. And I dare say that the weather would be also be noticeably cooler. And this week is gonna be the first major heat wave of 2021 and it's coming earlier in June than usual. The entire Southwest is now in a state of not only heat, but exceptional drought. Um, it's overwhelmingly likely that we're going to see cities like Las Vegas and Phoenix and maybe even Los Angeles suffering from extreme water rationing in the very near future. I mean, really near like this year or next, you know, and yeah. not to mention what's happening in California's Central Valley, which is devastation on a kind of biblical level. And this is what all of us have been screaming about for the past 25 years. And the situation is upon us now. It's actually upon us and we're still not responding. So I guess grief is my main response at this point, along with resolve to keep working politically to do whatever we can and to salvage as much of the earth as we can. Yeah, I uh, well said, Sean. And, um, you know, Joe, it's been it's been a really it's been a really great show and um, great couple shows. And it's just like, um, as I think about this, I think about the coronavirus, right? And I think about how the United States dealt with the coronavirus as opposed to the world's, right? I am now in a, in, you know, blue state, New Jersey, and it's really starting to feel like it's over. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and for most of the world, it absolutely is not. Right. Um, but the, and that is problematic, right? Because out of sight, out of mind, like, like, like we're saying, but I think though that the, 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 the hope, the Obama in me, perhaps the um, is that r at, though we are getting over the hump here in the United States and the rest of the world is a lot of the world, the developing world certainly is suffering. You also see the Biden administration giving sp ramping up the process of pushing out uh, uh, vaccines to the rest of the planet. Right. So maybe. Right. And this comes back to the political power issue. Right. Yeah. There is a too many of us, and there and there are, that are and and many of them are disproportionately powerful, who will hoard, who will build up the walls, who will say fuck you to the people in the water. Uh, but there are those among us who who care about human suffering, who care about uh, human flourishing, and we need to. And I think this is my big takeaway from this show is that we need on the left a to take to take power seriously and accumulate the power that we need so that we have people like President Biden in office and Kamala Harris and Obama and Clinton and all these people in office uh, who who see the connection between the what's happening in Bangladesh and what's happening here and what's happening in Central America and what's happening here and that we cannot we cannot wall our way out of it. We really ultimately we cannot. We cannot. So that those are my thoughts. So thanks again, Joe for, and, and Sean for such a great show. Oh, you're my pleasure. And just to close it off, I just want to say climate systems is the problem mm -hmm. and climate and uh, human systems and cultural systems is the solution. As you said earlier, Sean, we have to take a sy systemic approach to this and we need Absolutely. to have the politicians in power that understand that. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, Christoph, is what you're talking about with, with uh, the, the issue of power. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, both of you. It's been a very enlightening uh, conversation uh, and it's been a great two shows. If you like our show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, check out theradicalsecular.com and tell your friends to listen. 
New episodes post Mondays at noon Eastern on YouTube and all the major podcast channels. And if you're into reading, check out the blog at radicalsecular.com. I'm Joe Kipinti. Thank you for being here. And remember, wherever you are, you can be radically secular. Thank you.